So good evening, everyone. On behalf of TASMINT, I would like to welcome you all to MedCast Insights into Healthcare, a leading initiative by TASMINT. Today, it's a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Davendra Sharma, who is a consultant interventional cardiologist at Mabjad Hospital, Palanpur, Gujarat. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to hear from you on today's topic of discussion, Mexelitin. Mexelitin, an, anti, uh, an unexplored antiarrhythmic drug. Over to you, Dr. Sharma. Okay. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, so we'll begin without any delay. Uh, So, uh, uh, is my uh, uh, screen being shared? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, today's topic is uh, maxillating and unexplored antiarrhythmic drug. So, uh, why it is called an unexplored antiarrhythmic drug? Maxillating has been around for quite some time. There are studies uh, ranging from 70s and 80s from uh, where uh, maxillating has been available to us. But it has been unexplored and it was not very readily available. Even when we tried to order, it uh, used to take time for drug to come. So uh, it has uh, the issue of availability also has been an issue. And so now uh, quite a few companies have come out uh, with this drug. So uh, I hope that now it, uh, once uh, everybody became aware about this drug, then we will be seeing it more often. So. Uh, basically, uh, maxillitin is an antiarrhythmic drug. There are two types of arrhythmias, as we all know, bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias. So this drug is used for tachyarrhythmias, especially ventricular arrhythmias. So what is the prevalence of ventricular arrhythmias uh, in, around the world and in India? So it has in according to studies in US, there are the rate of uh, uh, approximately three lakh deaths per year are estimated to be due to VT and VF. And in India, the pandemic's heart failure registry, the incidence of VT, VF was observed to be about 4.5% patient with uh, clinical arrhythmias and heart failure. Uh, now, these studies have shown variable results because of the methods of recording the arrhythmia. Some arrhythmias may be subclinical. So, uh, there's quite a bit of variation in these studies uh, regarding the prevalence. Now, uh, how do we manage... Uh, 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 ventricular tachyarrhythmias. So uh, the first line of uh, first line of treatment will be antiarrhythmic drugs. Any patient presenting to us with a VT or a VF, uh, we try to cardio uh, revert using a, uh, a antiarrhythmic drug. So what are the indications of antiarrhythmic drugs? They are the first line of management for VT or VT storm. Uh, advantages with antiarrhythmic drugs are they are inexpensive, there is rapid effect decrease and uh, even after ICD implant, there is decrease in frequency of ICD shocks when we supplement uh, the ICD with antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, disadvantages are there, there are a lot of uh, some contraindications are there, the, there are some side effects of each antiarrhythmic drug, some uh, antiarrhythmic drug themselves may give rise to arrhythmias, that is they have proarrhythmic effects and patient has to take lifelong therapy. ICD is on the other hand are indicated for prevention of VT or VT uh, or, or secondary prevention from VT and uh, the primary prevention uh, strategy in ischemic and uh, dilated cardiomyopathies. Advantage is the ICDs have uh, demonstrated uh, significant mortality benefit in large number of randomized control trials. Disadvantage is with ICD is that they do not prevent VT. And uh, with each shock, there is an increased mortality risk uh, with shocks. There are uh, procedural complications while uh, implanting the ICDs. And after ICD implant, there are some risk of infection uh, at the pocket site or in the leads. Third uh, line uh, strategy is catheter ablation. Catheter ablation is, uh, is recommended, is indicated when there is an inducible uh, VT, mostly in monomorphic VTs, uh, we can do catheter ablation or a patient having a recurrent or idiopathic VTs. Uh, the advantages is that there is reduced VT burden and frequency of ICD shocks, and uh, there is decreased needs of uh, anti arrhythmic drugs. And in some type of VTs, we can completely eliminate the VT by doing catheter ablation. Uh, the disadvantages are it is an invasive procedure. There are possible complications associated. And in most of uh, dilated cardiomyopathies and ischemic cardiomyopathies, 
there is a risk, uh, there is a chance of recurrences depending on the morphology uh, and fourth strategy is sympathetic uh, denervation which is reserved only for refractive vts when all other strategies have failed patient continues to have vt storm then uh, we can go for sympathetic denervation advantage is it reduces vt burden and frequency of icd shocks but uh, the uh, disadvantage are there is limited evidence available and it has been it is an invasive procedure and has its own procedural complications so uh, come to, uh, coming to anti arrhythmic drugs there is this william uh, wagon williams classification uh, so mainly there are four uh, drug classes class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 class 1 are sodium channel blockers class 2 are the beta blockers class 3 is the potassium channel blockers and class 4 are calcium channel blockers another miscellaneous drugs are also uh, uh in this classification like adenosine and digoxin which do not fit in any of these categories uh so class 1 uh, are the sodium channel blockers which are further divided into class 1a 1b and 1c the uh, class 1a uh, the examples are quinidine procainamide disopyramide they are mainly indicated for ventricular arrhythmias af and wpw syndrome class 1b has uh, includes lidocaine mesalidine and tocanide and these are specifically reserved for only uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmias especially in post mi or in uh, the in uh, for their idiopathic arrhythmic effects class 1c includes flaconide propofenone morsesine and uh, they are uh, for paroxysmal af uh, and uh, the, what we say is the pill in the pocket strate uh, strategy and in sometimes for sustained vt class 2 are beta blockers which we are all very well versed class 3 is another class of anti arrhythmic uh, drugs and uh, the primary example is amiodarone uh, sotalol is an addition with has an additional beta blocking effect and ibutilide and these are uh, effective in both ventricular and supraventricular arrhythmias and class 4 are calcium channel blockers which again are useful for mainly uh, supraventricular tachycardias so our uh, mezzalidin is a class 1b drug which has primarily used for ventricular tachycardias and uh, as we can see ureticin is improved in uh, is approved uh, in ventricular arrhythmias usfda has approved for treatment of ventricular arrhythmias while while dcgi of india has uh, 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 indicated it in for treatment of existing or anticipated ventricular arrhythmias ectopia such as those after mi in ischemic heart disease for arrhythmia induced by drugs and for idiopathic arrhythmic effects uh, the ac uh, the american cardiology uh, college and the heart rhythm society guidelines recommend mezzalidin in treatment of ventricular arrhythmias so the 2017 aha acc and hrs and 2015 esc uh, uh, show uh, write that mezzalidin among the recommended anti arrhythmic drugs to prevent or treat uh, ventricular arrhythmias or ventricular fibrillation uh, similarly uh, 2014 european heart rhythm association hrs and aphrs uh, guidelines they show that Mezzalidin is among the recommended anti-arrhythmic drugs in patients suffering from symptomatic non-sustained VT, ventricular arrhythmias on an adequately uh, dose beta blocker or a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, so as to improve the symptom associated with arrhythmic episode. So it is a class two B indication, and uh, it is also among the anti-arrhythmic drugs for patients with um, stable heart disease and recurrent uh, sustained monomorphic VT in addition to uh, ICD and ablation, and it is a class two indication. as an uh, adjuvant therapy so uh, how how does uh, mezzalidin acts uh, as an uh, anti arrhythmic agent so it is a class 1b anti arrhythmic uh, agent uh, it is primarily a sodium channel blocker as we all know uh, uh, it acts uh, it, it is structurally similar to lidocaine but it is orally active it inhibits the inward sodium current reducing phase 0 so this phase 0 which is shown in red in this uh, 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 action potential uh, diagram uh, it is due to fast moving inward so sodium current and uh, so the mezzalidin acts on this um, so fast moving inward uh, sodium uh, current it blocks it and uh, it um, re reduces the trigger activity of of uh, seen in uh, this purkinje fibers and though the uh, effective refractory period is decreased there it results in increase in erp to apd ratio so this uh, uh, erp to apd ratio increase 
decreases the QT interval uh, and uh, decreases the triggered activity and automaticity. So, uh, it, uh, it is an orally active class 1B antenna drugs, it, uh, which blocks the fast sodium channel and opens potassium channel. Thus, it reduces the rate of depolarization of cardiac action potential. So, this, uh, this is uh, especially useful in uh, arrhythmias, which are due to uh, triggered activity, like due to early after depolarization and uh, delayed after depolarization arrhythmias. And uh, so, it reduces ventricular automaticity while shortening both action potential range and effective refractive period. So, this, uh, uh, this property is very useful because it doesn't cause uh, uh, QT prolongation but by, because it shortens both the action potential during an effective refractive period as compared to class 1 agents which cause uh, QT prolongation. So, maxillitin is uh, more or less electrophysiologically, it is similar to lidocaine and it is orally active. So, um, its effects are similar to uh, lidocaine and patient with normal conduction system it has minimal effect on cardiac impulse generation and propagation. There is no development of second degree or third degree AV block while using uh, this drug. And there is no prolongation of uh, ventricular depolarization, QRS duration or repolarization. Uh, so it doesn't affect the QRS duration and the QT interval. So it, uh, this drug has very less proarrhythmic uh, potential, which is uh, frequently seen with class 1 in class 3 uh, drugs. But it has some... Uh, it has some electrophysiological effects on patient with pre-existing conduction defect. In patient with already having some uh, conduction defect, there is depression of sinus rate, prolongation of sinus node recovery time, and decreased conduction velocity and increased ERP of the interventricular conduction system. So, in patients with uh, pre-existing conduction defect, uh, max uh, maxillary will increase the ERP of the interventricular conduction. So, there may be seen uh, some proarrhythmic events. So, patient with already existing conduction defects, um, maxillitin should be used carefully and the dose, dose adjustment should be monitored. So, uh, this is a, a, a table showing the electrophysiological effect of uh, all the antiarrhythmic drugs, especially we can see amiodarone, disopamide, flaconamide, they all have as, uh, the effect on SA nodal rate. So, they will decrease SA nodal rate, they will increase the AV nodal refractory period, they will affect the AVR interval, QRS duration, and QT interval is prolonged, so which is more pronounced with amiodarone. Uh, similarly, with uh, procainamide, uh, propofenone, quinidine, these all have a significant effect on SA node and AV refractory period and also on QRS and QT interval. But here, we, as we can see, lidocaine and maxillitin both have uh, minimal, none to very small effect on these drugs. Uh, on, on these uh, parameters, especially QRS duration and QT interval, which is very important property uh, and um, which increases the cardiac safety of these drugs. And uh, coming to hemodynamic effects, uh, the, the effect of um, maxillitin on uh, hemodynamic is small and usually not statistical significant uh, de decrease in the cardiac output. So, uh, this, uh, this uh, property is especially useful in post MI patient where we have borderline hemodynamics, any decrease in cardiac output can uh, can detriment can be detrimental to the patient. Uh, but maxillitin has no significant ionotropic uh, effect, and blood patient pulse rate remain essentially unchanged. There is mild depression of myocardial function similar to that produced by uh, lidocaine, as occasionally with IV therapy with cardiac disease. So, uh, coming to the pharmacokinetics. Uh, so, maxillitin is very well absorbed, around 90% from the GI tract, and the peak blood levels are reached in one in two to three hours. It is uh, 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 50 to 60% bound to plasma protein with volume of distribution around 5 to 7 liters per kg. Uh, unlike lidocaine, its first pass metabolism is low, so this is an orally active drug, and uh, approximately 10% is excreted unchanged by the kidney normal subjects. The plasma elucidation. Half-life is approximately 10 to 12 hours. Um, so coming to the doses and administration, here we are talking about the oral forms, that is capsule. So uh, doses must be individual on base of the response and tolerance, and both of which are dose-related. So uh, uh, maxillitin will cause uh, GI, uh, GI disturbance, so there will be a GI irritation. So uh, administration with food and uh, initially, 
uh, we initiate with 200 mg every 8 hours sometimes uh, going with 100 mg every 8 hours uh, uh, may be better uh, in patient who are not able to tolerate and when rapid control of arrhythmia is not essential and uh, there should be minimum of 2 to 3 dose between dose adjustment uh, recommend uh, is recommended and the dose adjustment should be in the increments of 50 to 100 mg up or down. So uh, this uh, flowchart explains the dosage regimen. When rapid control of tachyarrhythmia is essential, we should start with a loading dose of 400 mg and after eight hours, 200 mg should be given. And then we can uh, continue as uh, 200 mg per uh, every eight hours. But when rapid control of tachyarrhythmia is not essential, loading dose is not required, we can start with 200 mg every eight hours. Then we can increase, uh, we can go in increments of uh, uh, 100 mg every eight hours. And the maximum recommended dose is around 1200 mg per day. Uh, coming to contraindication, uh, has minimal uh, hemodynamics. Uh, it is to be, it has a mini, uh, it has some uh, negative anotropic effect. So it should be avoided in patients who are having and as it has uh, effect, uh, it it uh, in, it has effects on patients with already pre-existing uh, conduction defect. Patient with pre-existing secondary V block or third degree V block if, uh, should should not be on uh, started on mexilitin if they have no pacemaker backup available. Uh, coming to adverse, uh, mexilitin is generally well tolerated. It has reversible gastrointestinal signal and nervous system adverse reaction. So like uh, lidocaine, this is uh, the issue comes with uh, uh, the nervous system. Patient might have, uh, have lightheadedness, tremors, coordination difficulties. There may be nystagmus and which may limit the amount of dose that can be given to a patient. And it has uh, what um, it, it has uh, less upper... Uh, uh, it upper GI tolerability. So it may cause some upper GI disturbances. So we should be uh, giving mexilitin with food or antacid and we should titrate uh, uh, to the um, patient's titrate the dose to patient tolerability. Uh, now coming to clinical data. So this is written VT, VF episode and electric storm events and ICD intervention. So mexilitin is an oral available drug. So it, it uh, main role, it is an adjuvant therapy for in post ICD patients, patient with recurrent ventricular tachycardia and VF. And uh, in this study, mexilitin dose was 600 mg patient, 400 mg patient and eight months. Uh, the uh, were seen that uh, the amount of ICD intervention before mexilitin was 317, which was reduced to only nine per nine events. So the amount of ICD shocks was reduced. The amount of VTVF episodes recorded by the ICD was decreased from 285 to only 74. And the, um, uh, the amount of electrical storm events was also statistically uh, uh, decreased from 14 to only two events. Uh, in controlled, this is an older study from 1991. Uh, so it shows that there was a significant reduction in ventricular premature beats, spare beats, and episodes of non sustainability versus placebo. And uh, similar in effectiveness to the active agents, like it, it, it has got a moderate uh, uh, efficacy as an anti adenitor. And the, the effect of uh, this continues uh, has has been contained in long term use also and it uh, uh, this is an older study from 1980 lancet and it shows that mexilitin reduced ventricular ectopic complexes in patient with recent mi so uh, 344 patient at high risk of sustained mi were uh, uh, studies in and mexilitin was uh, administered in loading dose 400 mg followed by 250 mg 8 hourly for 3 months and uh, at 3 months at both one month and three months, the amount of ventricular premature complexes were uh, reduced with mexilitin use. And uh, coming to mexilitin as an, ad as an adjuvant therapy, so uh, patients, uh, why do we need anti uh, arrhythmic drugs in ICD patients? So, the anti arrhythmic the drug they will suppress both VTVF, they will suppress SVT, so they will reduce both 
appropriate and inappropriate shocks. ICD may sense an SVT is an VT, and then may, it may give a false shock, which may decrease the quality of life and uh, will be causing more distress to the patient. So it will uh, antiasmic drugs will increase the quality of life and consumption of uh, decrease the consumption of healthcare resources. And it will also increase the tachycardia cycle length. So the VT will the rate of VT will decrease. So VT will be better, uh, hemodynamic will be better tolerated. And as we all know, the uh, uh, VT with uh, with lower rate or more tachycardia cycle length will be better terminated by ATP. So it will decrease the amount of shock. So uh, as mexilatine is a safe oral drug, we can add as an uh, antiarrhythmic drug in ICD patients. And uh, uh, this study, uh, this is a small study of 29 patients uh, who had been uh, uh, um, on, who had been implanted ICD. So, mexilatine when added to amidon reduced the events VTAVF and appropriate therapy in patients with ICD. And uh, number of uh, uh, and number of treated VT episode mortality shocks from the different electrical storm events and uh, during. Uh, and storm events during mexilatine therapy was compared to match placebo and it, it was found to have a significant uh, decrease in all these primary and uh, secondary outcomes. So patient with uh, recurrent refractivity, uh, nine patients was uh, studied uh, and the treatment protocol was on day one of mexilatine mg. Uh, for 24 hours, amiodarone at uh, 1500 mg for 24 along with amiodarone, 600 mg oral, that is 200 TDS was given. And from day three onwards, every treatment was interpreted and only mexilatine and amiodarone it was given at 600 mg per day. And patients were followed at six, uh, six months. So this was a, this was a study for uh, in patients with recurrent refractivity. And uh, it has found that so uh, VT episode within three days was suppressed in approximately 33% of patients. And on the seventh day, approximately 66% of patients had total suppression of VT episode. So in refractory VT patients, two thirds of patients who were on uh, combination of amiodarone and mexilatine, uh, it was found that uh, uh, there was a suppression of ventric uh, refractory ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, one more application of mexilatine is a patient with uh, uh, QT interval. So uh, in this congenital channel pathology, especially long QT2 and uh, long uh, QT3, uh, long QT three, uh, not much effect is seen with uh, beta blockers. So maxillatine by reducing QT interval can be, is beneficial in patients. And uh, uh, this patient with uh, long QT syndrome, uh, pre and post, we can see a statistically significant uh, reduction in arrhythmic events after mexilatine. Uh, mexilatine is effective in shortening QTC in patients with long QT2, and it may provide an additional therapeutic strategy when combined with beta blocker in patient at high risk. So in some patient, if uh, when the trigger is not exercise induced, like long QT and long QT3, uh, uh, it may have an adjuvant effect on uh, uh, in uh, addition to a beta blocker. So uh, summarizing, uh, mexilatine is indicated in sustained ventricular arrhythmias, and it is an agent with moderate potency. Uh, it has been found the 40 to 60 percent uh, efficacy for ventricular tachyarrhythmias. It has an agent. It is an agent with appreciable safety uh, because it can be used in post MI patient patient with LV dysfunction, and it is safe in uh, QT prolongation. So when we cannot give amiodarone in patient who have VT associated QT prolongation. This drug is very handy, and the effects are reversible and they are non-lethal. So it, it has very minimal effects on the cardiac conduction system, and uh, um, the only uh, major adverse events are gastrointestinal and uh, uh, neurological, which are dose related and can be reversed by decreasing the dose. And it is class two recommendation by guidelines for management of VT. So it uh, it it can be used uh, initially as an uh, agent for to suppress the ventricular uh, premature complexes, or it can be used as an add-on agent uh, to other antiarrhythmic drugs like amiodarone, sotalol, beta blocker, or in patient with ICDs uh, where we want to decrease the amount of uh, VTVF episodes, amount of ICD shocks, and to 
decrease increase the tachycardia circle and so uh, um, the tachycardia can be terminated uh, with uh, atp and uh, uh, additionally uh, additionally it is and uh, uh, newer studies have found it to be useful in long qt2 syndromes and uh, which is where very few drugs options are available to us so uh, thank you for your kind attention I would request all the participants if they have any query, they can put their questions in the chat box. So, so I think we can wrap up the session, sir. Okay. Yeah, I think yes, sir, yes we sir. can conclude now. So, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma, for joining with us today. It was really an insightful discussion for us as well as for our listeners. I would also like to thank all the doctors for being with us and for their active, part, active participation during the session. Thank you and have a great day. Thank, thank you. So uh, I think uh, one question is there. If you could answer. Sir. No, I, I don't. Uh... I don't see a question. The question is uh, for how long uh, we can uh, continue this drug? Okay, uh, so this drug can be uh, antiarrhythmic drugs are uh, mostly lifelong therapies unless uh, there is uh, if uh, unless there is a reversible cause which can be corrected. So any patient who uh, who has been on antiarrhythmic drugs uh, has uh, has to be life uh, on lifelong if he has is having any structural heart disease. If it is a um, temporary reversible condition, then we can uh, gradually stop these drugs. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the Thank explanation. Thank you so much. Good night.